Good spookadus scare creepadocious, my fellow children of the night school fellows. My name is Edgy Chappie, and it is my honor to teach you today the terrifying and terrific traditions and tribalistic tendencies of our top-tier troublemakers, the Tieflings. I'm going to elaborate on the life of your average Tiefling, as well as the many, many customization options that can be found in supplemental materials. Keep in mind that, as always, there may be some slanderous and libelous fools who think that their understanding of the Tiefling is greater than mine, and these people should be chortled at with various jests and neener neeners until suitably silenced. But with that out of the way, let's begin. <coughs> <coughs> Holy, is that phlegm? So, a tiefling is a humanoid creature with the power of the devil and western animation on their side due to the fact that, at some point in that tiefling's family tree, a human made a pact with one of the big archdevils to, in one way or another, inject 20 cc's of that archdevil's bloodline into their lineage, and that human's descendants have been paying for it ever since. See, as a result of their demonic parentage, every tiefling gets big ol' horns, monocolored eyes with no pupils, dark and brooding hair, and any skin color of the rainbow. To complement this magical appearance comes actual magic, which tieflings are naturally able to control regardless of their adventurous profession they choose to walk in life. This combination of strange-sightedness and distinct link to evil are what give tieflings the very bad reputation that they have. Tieflings don't exactly have a big society or many cultural normative impacts on their lives as a whole, and that's largely due to the double whammy of being natural wanderers, as well as the INCREDIBLE racism against tieflings that prevents them from staying in one place for too long without being run out of town, which is largely due in part to the fact that tieflings look like freaky demon people. The stigma of evil that tieflings are forced to wear on their sleeves is what pushes them into the slums of cities, or clustered into small communities with other misfits that don't have the luxury of prejudice. As a result, tieflings, despite not being biologically molded towards evil, end up falling down that hole anyway as a rebellion against an unjust world. Of course, this doesn't account for all of tieflings, as a select few manage to push on past the racial prejudice and love the world in spite of its hatred towards them, although these tieflings are relatively rare even among tieflings who are themselves a rare sight to see. When you do see one, the chances are that, unless it's a descendant of Asmodeus, there is a high likelihood that you will never see that specific type of tiefling again, due in large part to the MASSIVE amount of customization that tieflings have from both the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide and Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. It's honestly really fitting that the stereotypical class race combo for the tiefling is as a tiefling warlock, because between the two you will find the MOST excessive amount of customization that'll make players think, wait, is this 3.5 again? For reference, you think it's bonkers that the elf has six subraces? The tiefling has eight, plus additional customization in the form of variant racial features. So without further ado, let me just roll up my sleeve leaves and dive into all these dynasties. So your average tiefling will come stock with a charisma bonus of plus two, dark vision of 60 feet, and a resistance to fire damage. After that, the features split off depending on your infernal heritage, with each subrace giving you a plus one to a stat, as well as a legacy of X feature that gives you a cantrip at first level, as well as a new spell at both third and fifth level, all casting off of charisma. When I name the spells, I'll always order them this way unless I say otherwise. To start with, normal player handbook tieflings are considered tieflings of Asmodeus, so they gain a bonus to intelligence, as well as the thaumaturgy cantrip, the hellish rebuke spell, and the darkness spell which makes this the quintessential tiefling that you'd expect to have in your games. Balzable tieflings also get a bonus to intelligence, as well as thaumaturgy, ray of sickness, and the crown of madness, so this is a more hexing and wicked tiefling. Despater tieflings get a bonus to dex, as well as thaumaturgy, disguise self, and detect thoughts, making them good at espionage as spies. Fiorna tieflings get a bonus to wisdom, along with the friends cantrip, charm person, and suggestion. This is my favorite subrace, and if you want to mess with people's minds, there you go. Glossia tieflings get a bonus to dex, the minor illusion cantrip, then disguise self and invisibility, giving them the best stealth and infiltration in the game. Levistus tieflings get a bonus to Khan, the Ray of Frost cantrip, and Armor of Agathis in Darkness, putting this one up as an upfront fighter tank. Mammon tieflings get an increase to Intelligence, the Mage Hand cantrip, Tensor's Floating Disc, and Arcane Lock, which makes it good at magically stealing shit from other people. Mephistopheles tieflings gets a bonus to Intelligence, Mage Hand, Burning Hands, and Burning Blade, making them sort of a fighty spellcaster. And finally, Zerial tieflings increase their strength and get access to Thaumaturgy, Searing Smite, and Branding Smite, making this the best melee combat tiefling you can get. Personally, I think that Subray with two mental stat bonuses are a little bit at a disadvantage due to the lack of synergy in the ability scores, but the difference really isn't that big since they all only give a plus one, and the spells given to each subclass is what really makes you want to pick them, since they can fit in practically any role that you might want a tiefling to be in. And just in case you STILL wanted more customization, the Skag gives a few variant features that you can swap out with your current ones. Since the Skag was released before Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, the variant choices can technically only be given to the base tiefling, but you can talk to your DM to see if they'll allow you to 
to modify the other subraces, although most of them are a mute point anyway, which I'll explain in a second. To start with, the Feral trait lets you swap out your normal racial ability score improvements for a plus one to intelligence and a plus two to dex, and this is the only trait that can be paired with another trait if you so choose. After that, you can give up your Infernal Legacy trait to either gain a new set of spells in the form of Vicious Mockery, Charm Person, and Enthrall, or you could say, screw spells, and instead take Bat Wings, giving you a fly speed of 30 feet whenever you want. Finally, instead of taking Hellish Rebuke from your Infernal Legacy trait, you can trade it out for the more active Burning Hands spell. Like I said earlier, the first three variant traits are sort of a mute point when it comes to Morgan Kane and sub races because they completely alter what the sub races were gonna alter themselves, but I still think that it's insane that Tieflings have just been given this much range and how mechanically flexible they're allowed to be. It really reflects the idea that when someone sees a Tiefling, they really have no idea what the Tiefling's capable of, and the fear of unknown, dangerous powers that it can hold just pushes communities at large to shun the Tiefling before it can do any damage to the normal, proper world that they live in. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like and comment if you did, subscribe if you want to be a cool dude, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can slowly make my entire life revolve around D&D. Also, if you want to stay up to date on all of your Davy news, I keep a link to my social media in the description below. But yeah, Davy out.